Hello, I'm William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, and uh, today is uh, April 27th. It's uh, around 3 a.m., and uh, that's why you know I, I look like a tired old man in, in, in this video. Um, I've got some time uh, here uh, with everything quiet, and I'd like to respond to a bunch of questions that we received over the past few weeks from parents and provide some in-depth answers um, that I think will be helpful. So I ask that you pardon uh, my appearance or the roughness of these videos because uh, I don't think that the folks writing with these questions and seeking answers to these questions care much about spectacle. Uh, I don't think uh, they, they really care about the quality of the video as much as they care about the quality of the answers. And uh, while I have some time to think through these things and, and get into them in depth, uh, I'd like to provide you with some, some quality answers. The question that I'm going to respond to in this video has to do with grade levels and classical Catholic studies. So here's, here's the question. Let me read it, and uh, then I'll, I'll go through it piece by piece in as much detail as I think is necessary. I've read and heard you explain on your walk talks that grade levels are not meaningful distinctions, but rather an arbitrary feature of modern education. Let me just repeat that. I've read and heard you explain on your walk talks that grade levels, school grade levels, like K to 12 grade levels, are not meaningful distinctions but rather an arbitrary feature of modern education. I certainly do teach that in my walk talks, so that's good. And I noticed that in your recommended class selections on the Academy website, that is, you don't start the bulk of classical studies until high school. Is there any reason you would not advise starting seventh graders on classical arithmetic? And then, when did or do you, in italics, start your own kids on their classical liberal arts studies? So these are, these are good questions. Uh, so let's get into this a little bit. As for these grade levels being, you know, arbitrary and artificial, that's not my opinion. That's historical fact. You know, the, the public school system was developed in America and, you know, some places in Europe in the, the mid to late 1800s. And we're basically taking kids from the time they're old enough to, to start leaving home, you know, potty trained kids, basically, um, kids who can go away from their parents for the day, which usually is, you know, age six or seven. Um, we're starting there, and then they're going until they reach 18 years old where they're ready to enter into, uh, you know, adult life, legally speaking, and, and get started with their, with their uh, career work. So the, the public school was designed to serve that entire window of, of time that students have, that children have, uh, where they can try to make good use of that time to, to learn. And so you just take that time, and it's from age, let's say, 6 to 18 or 7 to 18, and you count how many years there are, and there are 12 or 13 years. And that's, that's where the K-12 to system came from. It's not some kind of... Um, some kind of you know philosophical system or or necessary pedagogical system. It's just a practical reality that we have kids from ages six to eighteen, at, or five to eighteen even, and uh, you know that's that's twelve thirteen years. So they lay out this course of study based on the goals of the program, and they chop it up into into twelve or thirteen pieces, and and you know that's the K to twelve program. Uh, there's nothing. There's nothing philosophical or pedagogical about that. There's nothing you know, historical. There's no tradition uh, in any such system. It's just the necessity of this idea of public education, tax-funded citizen training in, in public schools. And then, of course, the, the, the modern Catholic parochial schools, for some reason, chose to, to follow that model, and just about everybody else has chosen to follow that model. Um, 
I don't think it makes much sense to follow that model, especially for small private schools and home schools where you're not even dealing with large classes of students, and it doesn't make any sense to, to sort them by age. Um, so unless you're in a, a very large school, uh, you know, it doesn't even make any sense to, to use the K-12 to grade divisions, but they have very little to do with anything academic. You know, the significant division points in the curriculum come at age seven or eight, where kids hit the age of reason. Um, and then you've got, let's say, the high school years where they've got to put together a four-year transcript to prepare for college because that's just conventional in our society. And it's, it's stupid to, to, to do things that are unconventional when you've got nothing better to do. Um, if you're planning to send kids to college, you, you might as well arrange four years of, of high school studies since you're going to have to prepare a transcript. So, you know, there are a few necessary points where, you know, there are some real educational issues to consider. But outside of that, the K-12 to program is, is really arbitrary and it's, there's, nothing, there's nothing serious about it. Uh, if you're homeschooling, um, you shouldn't, it doesn't make any sense to say my homeschool student who's studying alone by himself at home, you know, with no other kids his age is in third grade. That doesn't even make any sense. So that's why I discourage all of that talk and thinking uh, among homeschool families. But nevertheless, because it's just so ingrained into our souls at this point in 21st century America, um, and it's hard to get parents to even think or be willing to think outside of that box, even though they, they should. Um, I communicate course recommendations and when they can be started based on those modern grade level divisions just for the sake of convenience. And you'll see if you look at that, that page where I recommend those courses, um, you know, the courses overlap years and they, they, the same courses will be present in two or three different grade levels. So you can see that, that those grade levels aren't serious. Um, they're just recommendations of what courses uh, in normal circumstances would be appropriate for students at different ages. Okay, so that's what this question is about. Um, he asks specifically, since I recommend that most of the classical liberal arts courses, the real core courses, start in high school, am I saying that there's some reason why they can't start earlier? Uh, the answer is no. Um, you know, if we look back into history where there were, you know, great ca uh, classical schoolmasters, they had kids starting these things at five and six years old, seven years old. Um, but they were great schoolmasters. So, so that's, that's a different issue. Uh, it, it comes down to the skill of the teachers. For most, you know, average homeschool parents, they're not great schoolmasters. Um, and, and that's not a criticism. It's a reality because a homeschooling mother has a lot more to take care of than just teaching her children. She, she can't be compared to a 16th century schoolmaster. Um, so it's just not possible for a, a homeschooling mother to expect that she's going to get started with you know, classical reasoning with a 12-year-old student or classical grammar even with a 7-year-old student. Completely possible with, a, with an excellent teacher, but, but not realistic for, for uh, you know, the average homeschool mother. I think about my own wife, who's a classicist, you know, who studied classics and, and has worked with me. And I think that, you know, my, my own wife couldn't handle this as a homeschooling mother. So uh, it's very unlikely that, that, that other mothers will be uh, able to do more than she would. And so I'm, I'm not going to recommend that or even suggest because I think it would put um, a ridiculous amount of pressure on mothers and the mothers would be ambitious to, to try to do it and they would just you know, torment themselves and their children, and it would be a big, huge waste of time. So I, I recommend to homeschooling parents who I'm actually, you know, thinking of when I make those course recommendations, I'm, I'm suggesting to them what I think would be reasonable for them. And, and the main reason why I recommend that the core courses start when kids are high school aged is because what I'm thinking is, the kids, if they're, if they're 
managed well in homeschooling, they should be able to work independently using our system by that age, and they can lean on us for the help that they need rather than mom. So that's why I would, I would recommend that those studies um, start later. And there's a lot of good stuff to do in the earlier years that I think would be more within the reach of homeschooling parents in terms of what they can help with and handle uh, personally. Now, that's, again, it's not, it's not a criticism of homeschooling parents. Uh, and there may be homeschooling parents who are very well educated and, and organized and zealous and free to devote themselves to, to the work of homeschooling, and they can get as much done as an experienced schoolmaster could get done. You know, that, that's, a, that's an individual issue. But generally speaking, I have a good idea of, of who the average homeschool parent is and what they can handle and when, and that's what those course recommendations are based on. So am I saying that there's some kind of reason why a younger student can't get started earlier? No, that, that's not the point. Um, if you're, for example, if, if, you're, if you're a tutor um, and you're planning to work with students and you're actually a good tutor, you know, you can start with kids much earlier. Uh, you, you have to work s more slowly and patiently, but you can get them started younger and, uh, and work with them but again, those recommendations uh, have in mind uh, the average Catholic homeschool parents who will be working with the kids. So um, is there any reason you would not advise starting seventh graders? It's just a matter of what help and support that the students have. Um, I wouldn't even say seventh grade. I would say seven-year-olds. Because remember, the, the, real, the real issue here is, is the age of reason um, arrives around age seven or eight when students can really begin to, to get into any kind of study that requires uh, the use of reason. So before that, like before age seven, the kids should really be doing nothing but, but repetitive physical work or, or re, you know, memory work where they can just do what's within their power at that point in their life. And then when they come into the age of reason, uh, their studies can get more intellectual and, and complex. Uh, so, you know, that's the first thing to deal with. But then it's a question of what support they have and, and what subjects or studies would make the best use of that time based on what help and support they have. So um, that's not up to the curriculum or even up to the student. That's really up to the parent or whoever's working with the children. You know, I could start. I could start with a kid who's five years old. Look at the petty school lessons. That's what they are. The petty school lessons are me uh, getting started with kids who could be four years old and introducing them to the concepts that they're going to study in classical grammar and arithmetic. So uh, that's what it would look like at that level. Are you willing to do that? Is it worth doing that? You know, th those are those are practical questions. So. Um, of course, you can get started earlier, but it's going to require support and patience and, uh, you know, uh, a method of teaching and training that is appropriate for that age. You know, children, children are not going to understand the objectives. Young children are not going to understand the objectives of this learning. And so the, the motivation for them is going to have to be artificial and simple. You know, you can, you can get a kid to memorize a, a a Latin verb conjugation chart by offering him, you know, uh, some popcorn and a soda. I mean, kids are motivated by 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 pleasures uh, at that time, and you know, you've got to consider those sort of of, of realities. You know, um, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend using punishment as a as a mode of of uh, getting kids to to get work done, like the old schoolmasters. You know, they stood with a, with a stick in their hand, and if you didn't recite your, your you know, Latin declensions, you got whipped with it. You know, they, they used punishment to, to make those kids do those studies, and, and you've got to take that into consideration. Is that the relationship that you want to have with your children? Are you going to stand there and whip them like a, like a 16th century schoolmaster when they don't stand and answer the question? You know, that, that's not realistic for homeschooling. Though, though some parents will try it and destroy their family life, but it's not realistic. So the, I, I would say we've got to take more of a John Bosco-like approach of using pod, positive 
motivation. And that's not saying that, that there's no place for discipline and corrective discipline with children because they've got to be obedient. That's a different issue. But as far as the academic work, I mean, I, I don't know that I would place that burden on my children's shoulders and consider it a matter of, you know, parental commandment that demands obedience. And if you don't obey with these academic activities, you're going to be punished for, you know, the parents create that situation. I, w I would never make academic work a matter of commandment so the kids are going to get punished for it. Uh, you're going to make studies miserable. And so, you can motivate younger children with positive rewards, simple things. You know, my wife has, has you know, always used things like, um, you know, candy bars at the end of the week uh, or special treats during the day. Um, my wife does a lot, of, a lot to motivate our kids, taking them places and doing things with them. And, you know, that's all part of the, of the, the motivation of their daily studies. You know, there's some accountability. There's some... some uh, daily objectives for them to get done, and if they get those things done, and, and they're, they're objectives that are within their, within their reach, reasonably speaking, um, you know, they get rewarded, and, and they're motivated by the reward. And so they're not necessarily thinking about, you know, learning Latin grammar. They're thinking about doing their, getting their tasks done so that they can get to go to the swim club in the afternoon and, and, and play. Uh, and that's how that's how children are are motivated to study. And then, you know, they're they're doing this memory work and this drilling and repetition, and they they gain the knowledge of these things. And then when they get older and mature, they have this knowledge. So we don't care that they got it by, you know, without a direct interest in it. Uh, we're simply investing in them for their future, so that when they mature, they're going to have this in their head as the stuff that they've memorized and learned and repeated and drilled and recited, rather than, you know, the Barney songs and, and garbage like that. So we want to, to treasure up in them or invest in their memory over time and in their habits, things that are going to help them when they're older. So anyway... You can see that we can get into all kinds of, of discussions and practical things based on ages and what's appropriate and how to motivate and how to teach. And um, those are things that individual parents or tutors are going to have to work out. And that would determine what age uh, different children can do different things. So no, it's not some kind of necessary uh, rule um, and there are certainly reasons why I'm advising uh, the starting points as I do, based on, again, uh, what I would expect from average Catholic homeschooling parents, realistically speaking. All right? Um, that's all for that. Uh, now, th there's a video that I, I, I posted. Uh, I made a video titled, uh, I think it might be an article also on the Academy website, titled The Order of the Seven Liberal Arts or The Order of the Classical Liberal Arts, which talks about the necessary order that, you know, they need to be taught in. I think that uh, that video will be helpful to give you sort of a, uh, you know, if you think about the idea of a scope and sequence, I wouldn't necessarily say a scope, but a sequence of the order in which things are going to need to be done. The actual timing of that is going to be determined by those practical issues I talked about just a few minutes ago. So, um, no, there's no necessary reason why I recommend starting in high school other than it's what I think is realistic for the average high school parent, homeschool parent who, who I'm actually dealing with in the academy. And then you ask about my own kids. Uh, when did you or do you start your own kids on their liberal arts studies? So uh, I think it would be helpful to, to share some details about my own kids, right? What do my own kids do? Well, the first thing you're going to learn is that um, study is a virtue. And just as there are, are obedient kids and disobedient kids, there are uh, there are kids who are, are um, inclined to good things, and there are kids who are inclined to bad things more and less, you know, individually with different personalities. And all of these different kids are um, called to different things in life, and, and their personalities manifest themselves very early. 
Um, you know, I, I've been amazed through the years that the things that my adult children have chosen to pursue and do in their lives, um, when, I, when my wife and I think back, we can remember that, that these interests of theirs were, were manifest, you know, very early in their lives in different ways. So when we work with children, you know, uh, there's a helpful phrase that, that I've talked about recently that as parents and teachers, we're not engineers designing children. You know, God is the engineer. He's already designed these children. Um, we're shepherds. You know, our job is to guide them and direct them, uh, you know, within some relatively flexible limits as to what they need to do. And, and it's based on their personalities, their, their interests, uh, you know, what they're wired to do, vocationally speaking, um, all different strengths and weaknesses that they have individually. And, you know, we need to, to, to learn um, and get to know our children individually and try to direct them to the best possible end by the best possible means. You know, my, my children have varied so much. You know, for example, um, let's take my, my first two daughters. My daughter Elizabeth was born in 2001, and she was reading when she was three. She was always brilliant in terms of, of speaking and communicating and reading and writing. She was, communi she was reading at age three. My second daughter, Mary, who was born in 2004, so she was born three years after Elizabeth, she, she had no interest in reading. She was completely different from uh, Elizabeth in terms of our experience with her. And, and she really didn't get, get reading comfortably until she might have been nine or ten years old. Um, same, same program, same teachers, same, same environment, just a different kid, different, different strengths and weaknesses, different interests, different personality, and so on. Same thing with, with my boys. You know, I have one son, Samuel, who was born in 2006, who was mentally was just slow. Um, and, you know, really couldn't, couldn't study much of anything in terms of challenging stuff. He could do, uh, you know, catechism, memory work, chronology, things like that, could prepare for the sacraments and all that sort of stuff. S Samuel was, was great mechanically. He could go outside and do things, you know, on the farm or working with equipment and working with the tractor, repairing cars. I mean, he could do mechanical stuff that none of my other kids, he's more, he's more skilled mechanically than I am uh, as, a, as, a, you know, as, a, at a, as a middle school age student. He was just different. Um, his education looked completely different than my other children's education. So again, when, when you think of putting kids into a program and just shoving them all through this assembly line, You've got to realize that you learned that idea from the modern public schools. That, that's not how real education works. And when you're, when you're homeschooling and you're working with individual children, everything is individualized. That, that's, that's the whole benefit of homeschooling, in my opinion, is that you know, my son Jonathan got, a, got an education that was different from my daughter Elizabeth, and her education was different from that of my son David, and his was different from Mary's, and hers was different from Samuel's. And, you know, you go through the, through the whole crew, and, um, you know, we've had to adjust and individualize things um, for each kid at different levels. And there's not one... There's not one program that they all go through. And the CLAA, if you look at the academy, how it's set up, it's designed to allow for that. And I think that's one of the, what, one of the greatest strengths of our program is that it's real. It's, 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 it's a real um, self-paced, individualized study program where any student can pursue mastery at his or her own pace in his or her own way. Um, nevertheless, the curriculum is the same because there's only one curriculum. You know, there's only one God, there's only one wisdom, only one man, only one 
uh, moral philosophy, only one art of reasoning, only one art of grammar, only one art of math. So the curriculum can't change, but how it's studied can change. And, uh, you know, the classical liberal arts academy, I would argue, might be the only place anywhere where you can actually pursue a classical Catholic education um, in an individualized way. And I think that's the, that's the ultimate value of our program. That's the most significant value uh, of our program. Now, here, another problem that arises is, you know, oops, sorry, uh, with my kids, they, they knew early on, my older kids knew early on that they wanted to pursue military careers. They knew this early on. Um, and so when they, when they became persuaded that they wanted to pursue military careers and they started learning what was required for those military careers and they saw that classical liberal arts studies were not necessary for those military careers, you know, I as a father, my wife as a mother, we had a, a, a challenge uh, in dealing with this because, you know, we, we've got to respect our children's choices for their future vocations. And we don't want to make classical Catholic studies miserable. And at the same time, we've got to acknowledge that if they do, in fact, choose to pursue military careers, these things are not required for those careers. They're desirable. And we've got to work to keep them or I should say, we've got to work to present them to the children in a way that keeps them as desirable additions to their necessary preparations. So again, my kids know what's necessary for them to get started in the military. I've got 10 kids, and I may end up with eight military children. Um, the way things look presently, um, I've got seven sons, all of whom are intending to join the military, different branches with different different uh, pursuits within the military, but all of them are planning to join the military. And I've got three daughters. The oldest, Elizabeth, is a, is a combat medic, um, and my younger two daughters don't seem to be interested in military things. So out of my 10 children, I'm very likely going to end up with eight children in the military. I never anticipated that. So for us teaching our kids, once they learned what was necessary for their military careers, um, it was clear to them that classical liberal arts studies were not essential. You know, their admission was, you know, and their, their um, options available to them were not going to be determined by their, their mastery of the seven liberal arts. And so the challenge for us was to, to motivate them to pursue those studies for their own benefits, you know, not because they were necessary for their, their future career plans, but because they were necessary for life. They were beneficial and desirable for their own intrinsic benefits that they offer. And of course, that's a challenge. Um, and for, you know, for my older kids especially, they really couldn't appreciate that until they, they, they got off into college and started studying and, you know, looking around and, you know, my older kids are, are like straight A college students and they're looking around and seeing their, their classmates struggling and getting lower grades and they and they they wonder like why why does this seem so easy to us why does why is college so easy and the the answer is because of all of their classical studies the stuff they have to do at college is easy and so when they got into college and started seeing their success they started to realize like wow uh, my uh, our classical studies really gave us an advantage over our peers that that we could never sense we could never discern um those advantages and benefits until we got out with other students and, you know, began to see the fruits of, of those studies and enjoy the benefits of them. So, you know, that's been, that's been a, a, a pleasant uh, experience for my kids going into their adult lives, getting started in their military careers, going to college, and, and realizing how many advantages they have because of the benefits of those studies, which they didn't pursue as being necessary for their future plans, but they pursued them understanding that they were uh, beneficial in and of themselves. And, and that, that presents different challenges. So as far as when did my children begin there, well, they've all begun from the beginning. So, you know, um, my son David, for example, he was six years old when he learned to read. 
And he learned to read by doing the translation exercises in our Latin reading course. The translation exercises, he did them every day as a six-year-old little kid copying out the Latin, looking up and writing the English words. That exercise of, of copying and translating and, re- and you know, learning those words, that was the means by which he learned to read. So our kids, you know, my son Jonathan had the Greek and Hebrew alphabets memorized when he was four years old uh, just because, you know, my wife and I had time at that point in our family life and uh, we, we, we started teaching them things just by repetition and memorization um, because, like I said, if, if you're able to teach those things, uh, there's no age at which they can begin to learn because memorization starts from the beginning. You know, that, that's where they get their whole English vocabulary from. It's just memorization. If they can memorize English vocabulary, they can memorize Latin vocabulary, Greek vocabulary, math facts, catechism questions, Bible verses, on and on and on. It's just, it's just memorization. So again, that, that's going to depend on parents drilling that content. And, you know, we did that for our at least for our older kids, life got busier as time went on and we couldn't do the same, we couldn't give the same attention to all the kids, but we started as early as they could. And, and you'll see those course recommendations. I mean, for our kids, it was, it was daily Bible reading, catechism, um, Latin reading, modern arithmetic, just because they were learning math facts and stuff like that. Um, Latin vocabulary, world chronology started from as early as they could start reading or listening to lessons, Um, daily scripture reading, uh, having them as soon as they could learn to start typing, type responses to the daily scripture reading questions. You know, we started that as early as they can start. My daughter, Anna, my youngest right now is is eight, just turned eight. and she's studying world chronology and Latin reading and um, English grammar and arithmetic. So, so she's getting started in, in some of the classical liberal arts courses. Uh, but my wife and I, at this point in our life, are very busy. You know, we, we don't have a lot of time to work in the, individually with Anna. And you might say, oh, well, that, that's really not fair. The poor kid doesn't get attention. It, it's more complicated than that because in our family, we had to work very hard to establish classical Catholic studies with our older kids because it was just us sort of in the middle of the whole world trying to establish this culture of classical Catholic studies in our family. It was very difficult to get it started and established with our older kids, whereas our younger kids growing up, they just take that culture for granted, you know, and and they have the added benefit of having our older kids tell them and testify to them that these studies are important. And they've already seen their their older brothers and sisters go through this program, go off to the military, go to college, succeed in college, and, and all that. So, you know, while there are negatives with the younger children, and, you know, the busyness of life and things like that, the, our, our inability to spend as much time with them as we could with our first children, there are also many advantages that the younger children have that make things much, much easier um, for them than they were for our older children. So there's a trade-off in these things, and it, it, it really doesn't work the way that I think many people would think that it works. But to answer that question and just get to the point, um, we start our children with classical studies as early as they can pursue them. And uh, they also pursue modern studies like English grammar and and modern arithmetic um, because we want to take care of those those modern school requirements because they're they're not not burdensome. Uh, They're not difficult for us to pursue. But we get them started in classical studies as early as uh, as early as we can. Now, again, the goal when working with young students, with which you know, most parents, they don't listen to me when I explain this to them, and, 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 they, and they struggle because of it, but the goal is not to worry too much about academic achievement with the younger children. It's to, it's to work on helping them to become 
independent students. That's, that's really what needs to be focused on because if you can train your children to become independent students, then your children can begin to work with us directly. And, you know, you have our help. If you, if you don't teach your children to work independently, then you can't make use of the help that's available for your children. And, you know, you're just spiting yourself. And, and kids who are 13, 14, 15 years old and can work independently and, you know, can contact us, chat with us, meet with us, um, use the forums ind independently, things like that, they're going to get way more academic work done than kids who are sitting around waiting for mommy to come and type their answers for them, waiting for mommy to print their less. You're just not going to get things done that way. And so if you would stop worrying about academic achievement in the early years and focus on helping the children learn to become independent students, um, the earlier they become independent students and begin working with our system, um, the, the, the sooner they can start you know, reaching out for help on their own. And that's when their progress really begins to, to take off because you know, mom is no longer the limiting factor in what they can get done each day. You know, by the time my kids are, um, let's say, 10 years old, they already, they're already very comfortable using the whole system, taking quizzes, studying, submitting assignments, checking their grades, all that. They can do that by themselves. And once they get to that point, um, there's really not a whole lot of help that they need. It's just a matter of time, and, and we've got to be patient with them and give them time to work through the courses. So there's a lot to talk about, as always. And uh, with my kids, like I said, they've all been directed through our curriculum individually based on their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, and because of their interest in military vocations, which again was something that I never anticipated, you know, I'm not a military person, but all of my kids, almost all of them are interested in the military and successful in the military. Um, that just was something that, that wasn't anticipated. So we had to really emphasize the, the, the motives for studying classical Catholic curriculum uh, without, you know, having the, the, the artificial threat of, you know, oh, you're not going to be able to do this or you're not going to be able to go on. And Our kids knew early on that that was not going to be true. And so we really had to talk through the benefits and explain to them why we ask them to do these studies and go through that. And um, you know, that was a challenge early on and is much less of a challenge today, as I explained. So that's what our kids have done. Our kids have gone on to military careers. My oldest three going on four are um, in college now doing great. Jonathan is uh, in his last year as an ROTC cadet, um, you know, getting great, doing great in college and his military stuff. Elizabeth is, she's a junior in ROTC, a, a, a straight A student in college doing great. Um, David's just getting started. Uh, he's, he's, he's in the reserves as a combat engineer, not sure if he's going to pursue ROTC yet or not. And then Mary is our first non-military uh, kid getting started in college, and you know she's always been a been an oddball. She's interested in in uh, you know if, if you put her her interests together, she's she's interested in art and fashion, and she loves history. Um, she loves to study history, um, but she's also got an artistic side to her that my older kids didn't have, so. We're going to see what exactly she ends up doing because uh, she's she's an oddball at this point. She she doesn't follow in line with the other kids, and behind her is a whole string of kids heading for the military path. So uh, yeah, they're all different, and their their transcripts look different. Their studies and the pace of their studies look different. What we emphasize in their studies differs one by one, and like I said. That's the whole benefit of homeschooling. So if you think that your kids should just be put on a, you know, the Seton program where they all study the same things, that, that just makes, that, that really takes one of the greatest benefits of homeschooling and sacrifices it out of, a, out of an unreasonable concern 
for keeping your kids on pace with the public school when nobody cares about that. There's no need to do that. And there's so much more that could be studied if they were allowed to work through it individually. And if you can get them studying independently by the time they're hitting the high school years, there's no limit to what they could study in those high school years. And like I said, if parents aren't willing to do that, uh, they're just sacrificing many of the benefits of homeschooling, and the kids ultimately pay for that. So anyway, I think I've answered those questions, um, you know, how this all relates to the grade level system. It doesn't. Um, why we recommend starting certain courses, you know, in the high school years, it's based on the abilities of the average homeschool parents. And then lastly, what we've done with our own kids or what we do with our own kids and why we do it, um, we start them as early as possible in classical studies. And uh, we usually don't have much trouble from them in terms of those classical studies. I mean, obviously, they get, they get boring and difficult at times, and we take a break and pick them back up. And, um, you know, you've got to learn how to manage students working year-round for 18 years in, you know, in a homeschool. Uh, You've got to learn how to manage that realistically. There's times to, to push. There's times to take a break. There's times to, to, to bear down. There's times to just let them, let them sit there and be bored and um, you know, just go through some, some ruts at times. But uh, you know, in the long run, you've got to look at the overall production long term and be patient and give them time. And then, and then as they start to get to the end of their, of their high school years and they're looking at the options opening up for them for their adult lives, all of a sudden you've got this last gust of wind that fills their sails. And in those, those latter high school years, uh, you know, they, get, they can get loads of work done because they're, they're st they see the finish line as far as their homeschool work is concerned. And... Uh, you know, you catch up on things that weren't done in previous times where time was wasted or not used well and so on. So anyway, uh, I think that's a good response to those questions in terms of what I would, would say. And uh, if that begins to, you know, trigger some new questions, let's take those up separately because uh, I think we should, should uh, bring this response to an end here for that question. So um, as for grade levels, getting kids started, when to get them started, why our recommendations are what they are, um, I think I've explained the reasons for those things and uh, hope that's helpful. If you've got any questions or anything is not as clear as you think it could be, just let me know and we'll, uh, we'll dig in and, um, and go further in these things. Feel free to comment on the YouTube channel uh, under the video. I'll, I'll see and respond to those comments, so, so don't hesitate to do that. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll try to make these, make these answers as clear as they need to be. And like I said, if other issues come up, just let me know. God bless.